This is home. Everything that we are, everything that has been, lies on this single dot. Strangely, just lucky enough our home is in the precise zone for life to exist. Move our planet closer to the sun and we'll have this. Move our planet just a bit further and we'll likely have this. I suspect our home is not here just because it was here. I mean, looking at the vastness of the universe, all of these billions of years across, just to make the right combination, the right moment, the right distance, and the right time, just to make us here. It's like a deck of cards, shuffled many times, just to make it finally sorted from ace to king. Maybe just the way the dealer wanted. Well, this is pretty thought-provoking conjecture if you ask me, and that's why today we're going to talk about this topic and beyond. When I refer to the zone that's comfortable enough for abiogenesis to happen, for life to exist, and for civilizations to flourish, actually it has a name. It's called the Goldilocks Zone. It's one of the best tools scientists have to begin narrowing the search for habitable worlds. By definition, it's the orbital distance from a star where temperatures would potentially allow liquid water to form on the planet's surface. Not a lot of people know this, but the term Goldilocks Zone was actually derived from a 19th century tale. Goldilocks and the Three Bears A young girl named Goldilocks, she enters a house which belongs to the three bears, and she eats some porridge on the table. One of them is too hot, the other one is too cold, the final one is just right. So just like the Goldilocks Zone we talked about. It might be true that billions of planets and more are in this Goldilocks Zone, outside our solar system. But just what kind of life are we talking about? And how do we even define life and intelligence? For example, are we excited if we discover bacterial, single-cell organisms live? For advanced species like the human being to emerge as intelligent with cognitive abilities, there's just too many Goldilocks factors that need to occur. Like the stability of the atmosphere and chemical composition, consistency of temperature on the planet, the stability of the solar system, last but not least, the stability of the galaxy. Just a slight weak to those conditions, life is instantly, in less than a second, crushed to nothing, dissolved to nothing. You'll suffocate to death and at the same time roasted to ashes, which are then blown instantly away. Perhaps not the best one second of your life, is it? Propelled by curiosity and ingenuity, humankind is strived to find the answer to this bigger question, and also what we can learn about it to understand how we came to be on our home planet. In the next part of the video, we'll discuss what we have found so far in the research of this catalog of known worlds, aka the exoplanets. As stars move across the night sky, people of the ancient world have wondered about their place in the universe. Babylonian and Egyptian astronomers inherited a few insights that later became the basis for modern astronomy. The modern search for extraterrestrial life has been around since the 1980s. Back then, by just using a rather simple telescope about 2.5 meter long, scientists could detect this planetary disk. Just a bunch of dust and gas around the star Beta Pictoris. Fast forward to the early 1990s, that's really when the discovery of exoplanets skyrocketed. The Space Shuttle Discovery with the Hubble Space Telescope, our window on the universe. And soon enough, the first exoplanets were discovered. These planets were specifically weird in a way. Instead of orbiting a star like our planet, these two orbit a pulsar. If you don't know what that is, imagine a rotating star. It emits electromagnetic radiations from the two poles. These two exoplanets are constantly bombarded by the radiation from the star. Say goodbye to organic life and biodiversity. It is estimated that there is at least one planet for every star in the galaxy. This means that there is something in the order of billions of planets in the Milky Way galaxy alone and many of them have a similar size to Earth. So far, NASA scientists have discovered 4,000 plus exoplanets, mostly within a 3,000 light year distance from Earth. This brings us to a few exoplanets with distinct uniqueness that's worth mentioning. Let's go through a few of them now. Here's a poster from NASA about the planet HD 40307G. Experience the gravity of this planet, because one thing for sure, the gravitational pull here is much, much stronger than Earth. Or what about this exoplanet, Kepler-16b? It's unique because it orbits two stars, just like Tatooine in Star Wars. 
Imagine how cool that would be to wake up and see double shadows like this. Here's one more example, Kepler-186f, where the grass is always spreader on the other side. This is completely hypothetical as of now, but future space observation could provide an answer of whether there is an atmosphere, water, and thus grass on the surface. But one question you might ask up until this point, what's up with all the weird names and numbering of these exoplanets? Like Kepler-16b, HD40307g, or even the first two exoplanets ever discovered. Well, the International Astronomical Union set a guideline that dictates the naming of these exoplanets. In summary, the first word is either named after the star or the telescope that finds them. Take for example Kepler-16b, which was formerly named as Kepler-16abb. This is because it was discovered by a telescope named Kepler, and it's the 16th star system detected by the satellite. The capital AB is because it orbits a two-star system, A and B. And finally, lowercase b indicates the order of the planet's discovery in the star system. It usually starts from B, C, D, and so forth. Speaking of discovery, this brings us to how could these exoplanets be detected? What modern methods did we use to discover them? We'll talk more about that in the next part of this video. Scientists have suspected the existence of worlds outside our solar system for thousands of years. What became the turning point was the invention of the first telescope in the 16th century. And then, the story of Galileo's observation with the telescope illustrates just how a tool can dramatically change our understanding of the cosmos. Going back to the world of exoplanets, various modern techniques have been used to discover the existence of the known worlds. As a rule of thumb, it's almost impossible to spot an exoplanet simply by directly looking at them through a telescope, mostly because they are outshined by the stars they orbit. So how did the scientists find these 4,000 plus exoplanets then? Many methods have been developed to find these planetary bodies. Some of them are radial velocity and gravitational microlensing. But the most used and the most prolific form of finding exoplanets is what astronomers call transit a method in which an exoplanet transits the host star and thus reduces the star's light. Take this graph for example. The y-axis represents the star's light, and the x-axis, time. Now, when an exoplanet transits a star, it blocks out a little bit of this light curve, and therefore the curve drops to a certain value. Generally, by using this method, we'd expect a considerably small dip in the light curve. For example, if there was an Earth-sized exoplanet orbiting a star similar to our Sun in size, this usually produces a dip of only 0.008%, which is barely noticeable in this graph. Take the largest planet in our solar system, Jupiter, and we'll see about 1% drop in the brightness of the star. 1%. That's why searching for transiting exoplanets requires highly precise measurements. But there is a weird and mysterious phenomenon about this whole transit method. A star named KIC 8462852 was observed to have unusual light fluctuations. In March 2011, its light curve dropped by about 15%, lasted almost a week, and transitioned back to its normal brightness in a couple of days. A planet with the size of Jupiter would only drop the brightness by a maximum 1%. So this 15% drop, is it because of several ginormous exoplanets superimposed upon each other as we see them from Earth? But to make things even stranger, things got really messy in February 2013. The data reports that there is another dip of an even more substantial dip, a 22% reduction. How could we make sense of this anomaly? One probable takeaway is that there must be something in space that was getting in the way and blocking the starlight. When I first watched the TEDx talk about this, my science fiction mind got triggered. Could it be that there is an advanced alien civilization? who could harness the energy of their host star in a very efficient way, perhaps just like the concept of a Dyson Sphere. And looking at one paper written by the lead researcher of this weird phenomenon, it says that all the fluctuations are real and not due to statistical or instrumental variations. This finding really puzzled astronomers and astrophysicists. Hypotheses range from a swarm of comets orbiting the star, a debris disk surrounding a black hole located between the star and Earth, and finally, the aforementioned alien-built megastructure. We could take this one as a last resort hypothesis. 
but new observations suggest that the real cause is dust. Perhaps the remains of a planet the star recently destroyed. It is the most reasonable option as to why the star's light appears to dim and brighten. The new data shows that different colors of light are being blocked at different intensities. We're skipping a lot of details here, because actually to get to the conclusion, there was just too much observation that happened. Like nearly a dozen telescopes constantly collected data in almost every wavelength of light. And not to mention that this private project was backed up by more than 1,700 enthusiasts, hobbyists, backyard astronomers, and other citizen observers. The public was psyched for this science, which they could see unfolding firsthand. And up until this point, it's worth asking the question, why do we care about spending billions of dollars searching the nearby stars? Or listening 24-7 for repeating radio waves for signs of Earth-like planets? In all of this, just to have at least some evidence that life has evolved somewhere else in the galaxy. So in the next part of the video, we'll explore this premise in detail. Coming up next, right after this. As we gaze into the clear night sky, we all wonder the same age-old question. Philosophers have been asking this question for thousands of years, yet we are the first generation who have the tools and the knowledge to answer this question with scientific observations. In one way or another, each new planetary system that we discover teaches us a little bit more about how the universe works, and how the Earth, the Sun, and the solar system fit into the whole. In general, we can conclude two main motivations why we want to discover and observe exoplanets within the Goldilocks zone of a planetary system. Number one, finding life viability. There's a lot of speculation that our future lies on another planet, not on Earth. Even Professor Misha Kaku dedicated an entire book, The Future of Humanity, talking about this concept. When we are looking for life viability, we are looking to find planets that humankind can occupy in the future. When we look back in history, about 99% of all life forms have gone extinct. Sooner or later, humankind will be going through this extinction cycle as well. And the forecast that when the sun is turning to a red giant and swallow Earth in a few billion years, all living beings on Earth will have to deal with the consequences. So when looking at the bigger picture, considering all the probable future threats to mankind, preparing for some kind of relocation plan is our final frontier. Number two, understanding the phenomenon of life. What finding exoplanets do for us is to open up a vast exploration area to look for other habitable worlds. If we could find life in those worlds, there are a few questions we can ask, like, will they be a carbon-based life form or will they be based on something completely different? If, for example, we found that life on another planet had DNA, just like all living things here on Earth, then we could sequence that DNA of that life form and see if it shares chromosomes with life on Earth. So in a nutshell, learning about how life is different on other planets would tell us an immense amount about how life on Earth came to be. Because of these two main reasons, we found ourselves right at a crossroads in the search for life. On April the 4th, 2001, an astronomer from Geneva University announced the discovery of a planet, HD 28185b. The planet, which is nearly six times as massive as Jupiter, is the first to be found in the Goldilocks zone of its planetary system, where life could possibly exist. But to give you a little bit of the nuance, there are just too many trivial factors that needed to occur, and getting the right combination is extremely hard. For example, if you want to calculate the average temperature that some exoplanet has, given its distance from its host star, you'd need to know a lot about that exoplanet, like the kind of atmosphere it has, the albedo factor, and whether it has any kind of greenhouse effect. There is even an entire chapter just talking about temperature of the planet as one of the factors. The troubling thing is that sometimes scientists don't know those factors, so calculations can give wrong answers. Take for example Venus. Using the previously shown equations, if we calculate the mean surface temperature of Venus, then we'd expect quite an extreme margin of error when comparing the value to the actual surface temperature. This brings us to, out of all the 4,000 hitting records of exoplanets found so far, maybe not even 10% qualify to be habitable. And out of that 10%, who knows if we could ever find the 1% outlier, where that exoplanet contains any remnants of life, let alone the odds that intelligent civilization would arise from that life. Many people would find it disheartening to learn that after all, we're entirely alone in this vast universe. 
On the other hand, our planet, from the earliest times, was just like any other, winning a lottery ticket in the Olympics of Cosmos, while cheering for the cult of life and intelligent life. Venus, Mars, and perhaps any other exoplanets in the universe had their chance as well. But only in our world did life sustain and thrive, and eventually give rise to an intelligent and technologically advanced civilization. Perhaps for now, our planet is all that matters, Earth and its perfect position in the gold lock zone of the Sun. But humans, as curious living beings, continue to find out what lies beyond our space. This same pioneering spirit is what caused us to spread out and colonize our entire planet. All of the technology, science, and mathematics are just the consequence of that same drive. Therefore, space, because we are human. If this video has been helpful in any way, don't forget to give the thumbs up and subscribe to the channel, and press the bell notification button to get notified for more curiosity videos like this. I'll see you again in the next Beyond Ideas videos.